we're going straight into the evening's entertainment. Are we like, can we say kind of technically that we're opening up for Busta Rhymes? Because <laughs> that's like a lifelong dream of mine. I mean, I feel like we can probably say that, right? I've already put it on my LinkedIn profile, okay, so cool. it has to be the case. All right. All right. Let's get started. Uh, so welcome to Anatomy of Medical Device Hack. Um, we are three Motley Crew folks trying to save lives through security research. Um, so sadly, Bo Woods could not join us. He's at Hardware I.O. in Europe, so he is doing some good things. But he is here in spirit. Um, I'm Josh Corman. I'm one of the founders of IamTheCavalry.org, and I'm the director of the Cyber Statecraft Initiative at a policy think tank in D.C. called Atlantic Council. Christian? Uh, my name is Christian DeMath. I'm an emergency medicine physician out of California. I'm also a clinical informatics fellow at UC San Diego. So if you see me at work, you're having a really bad day. My name is Jeff. I specialize in anesthesiology and pediatric medicine. Uh, I go by the name The Candyman in the hospital, so I got all the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we met, actually met three DEF CONs ago on the Cavalry's first birthday in the green room. We were about to present the, the one year progress and we were like, oh wow, we really want to see this talk on hacking 911. And it was these two physicians, or med students rather, I'm like, you're physicians and hackers? We've totally got to do something together. So it took a while, uh, but we've been doing things quietly and building to a crescendo. And we're going to show you some of the fruits of that. Um, if you don't, uh, one, this is part thank you and part uh, our Twitter handles and part a reminder. If you're not familiar with I Am The Cavalry, we launched four years ago on August 1st at B-Sides Las Vegas and DEF CON. And the idea was that our dependence on connected technology was growing a lot faster than our ability to secure it, specifically in areas affecting public safety and human life. We now like to shorten that to say wherever bits and bytes meet flesh and blood. Uh, so we have a lot of projects to try to make uh, medical devices safer, uh, autonomous vehicles, maritime, high-speed rail, and anything that can hurt you, uh, as we're seeing uh, starting to happen more and more. Um, but we really want to thank DerbyCon because um, while we set out the alarm and said, if the cavalry isn't coming, it falls to you to be part of the solution. For you to declare I'm the cavalry, it was really here. Dave, with very little notice, gave us um, the stables downstairs for the whole weekend for free as a constitutional congress. We didn't know if anyone would show up. A hundred people showed up, it was packed, and we really dug into the meat of who do we want to be and how we're going to organize and operate. So Derby is uh, kind of helped us birth into the scene. And one of the things that came up at that point was uh, a law professor, Anir Matwishan, she said, everyone keeps waiting for dead bodies, right? Nothing's going to change until people die first. And we kind of said that during our reveal, but what she pointed out is there isn't going to be a single attack. It's going to be more like this. This is the Burning River in Ohio. And she told the story of how the Cuyahoga River caught on fire and stayed on fire 22 times across about 70 years before people said enough is enough. It, a photo was taken in Time Magazine. The right story was take, told at the, just the right time. It had taken down bridges. It had done property damage. They had to rebuild several times. So. It's more a matter of that you're going to have to have several fires before you'll see the political will or the public outcry for some sort of corrective action. And in fact, when you waited for public outcry, some of the reactions to this actually made things worse. So it was always our belief that we wanted to get in front of this and be a helping a hand instead of a pointing finger and engage as an ambassador and a translator uh, as, as, a, as early as we could. Uh, and it's hard to argue that we haven't had fires the last couple years, right? We finally, we knew you could hack power grids, now we know it's done by the Ukraine. We knew that you could use Shodan to find hard-coded passwords in water facilities or other internet-connected safety critical systems. Now the Iranians have been proven to have done so in upstate New York. Uh, the one that really scared Bo and I enough to quit our jobs and go into the think tank was Last February, Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital got hit by a Java deserialization flaw in one JBoss library in one device, and it shut down patient care for a week. They diverted ambulances to other facilities. Can you imagine being in the back of an ambulance and having to go through LA traffic up the street? Uh, procedures were canceled, the services were degraded and delayed. And I said, look, if, if an accident can take out a hospital, what could a bad actor do? And what I meant by that is when we had researched Anonymous with Jericho and I for a couple of years, we had predicted that some sort of extremist groups may pick up the blueprint of Anonymous. What we didn't realize is a member of Team Poison, Junaid Hussein, also known as Trick, 
actually, after getting out of prison, left the comfort of the Birmingham, UK home, moved to Raqqa, Syria with his wife and child, and founded the Cyber Caliphate before getting hit with a drone strike uh, after DEF CON two years ago. So there's, a, there's actually a documentary on the life and death of Trick, but very few of us even realize that while we are very dismissive of the, the hacking skill of people like him, that he wasn't very sophisticated, he was certainly talented enough to attack Windows XP in a hospital and have a similar effect to one or more. So that was a, of deep concern to us. And it's not so much that we thought hospitals couldn't handle any attack or power outage, it's that when you have this failure, we felt it'd be more like the deep water horizon where it's just gonna be gushing on the news every single night because they just don't really have the right staff or training or infrastructure to defend themselves. And we've enjoyed many years of obscurity where hospitals were left alone. They were always vulnerable, but they weren't targeted. And last year alone, uh, it went to the number one target of ransomware globally. So with that, you know, you had different waves of attacks like the Mirai botnets where this tsunami of technical debt showed you that if you had these unpatchable devices with fixed credentials, internet facing, it was such a large attack that we really couldn't stop it with DDoS prevention. And when we, we saw this, we went straight to the Food and Drug Administration and said, you know what else has internet connection, fixed credentials, and is mostly unpatchable? Most medical equipment in hospitals. Right? So this could be a $500 million, excuse me, a $500,000 MRI machine. It could be a bedside infusion pump hooked up to a loved one. And this notion that we might just do something like BrickerBot, like a white worm, just to take these devices out, that's fine theoretically if it's a $100 camera. Not fine if it's an infusion pump hooked up to a human or in a natal, natal intensive care unit. So uh, one of the other things I did is I was on the Healthcare Cybersecurity Task Force for Congress for last year and a half, and right about when we were about, we we're gonna publish the report, some really bad stuff happened, but for those who haven't heard this, here's the executive summary of the uncomfortable truths we uncovered. Um, there were about 18 of them, we picked the top five, but the headline unanimously was that healthcare cybersecurity is in critical condition. And the five top things we wanted to highlight are that uh, overwhelming majority of our health delivery organizations don't have a single single security person on staff. Our, our best guess is, our best case is about 85% of our hospitals don't have a single security person. Not one. And nor do they see any resource to ever even try to fix that. Number two, they're trying to defend really old legacy stuff. So Windows XP is often a best case scenario. Uh, not just for their back office, but for embedded systems. Uh, you know, um, Paul Azadorian saw Windows ME on one of his devices. Number three, um, meaningful use, which is the push to try to try tie reimbursement to the re ability to receive and transmit electronic health records actually caused this problem. You took devices that were never designed to be connected to anything and you forced them to connect to everything. So it leads to these flat, unsegmented networks where it increases the blast radius so a flaw in any one part can hurt most of the hospital, if not all of it. Which is number four, that vulnerabilities can actually affect patient care. This isn't about HIPAA or a confidentiality loss of a patient record. This is about the ability to deliver life-saving services at a time when you most need them. And lastly, if you think this is a rare occurrence, the, the typical medical devices have over 1,000 CVEs each. Uh, this one in particular had 1,418. So let me tie this together. Wait, hold on, Bo. Can, I'm sorry, Josh. Can you say that again? Let me tell you that one more time. One of these devices had 1,418 CVEs. And this is not an outlier. It's a, usually about over 1,000. Now, they're not all exploitable, but it takes one to cause the kind of harm you saw. So stitching that together, in 85% of these cases, there's not a single security person on staff. They're trying to defend older and less uh, defensible operating systems that are overconnected to each other and reachable by the outside world causing a blast radius that can affect patient care for an entire hospital, and the average device gives you over a thousand chances to do so. So this, sh this bothers us. Um, and this isn't some blog piece or marketing material, this is a Congressional Task Force report on the record. So one of the things I said that upset some of the hospitals is if you cry that there's no resources, you know, you can say you can't afford to protect it, but why do we, what does that mean we can afford to connect it? So trying to be a little more loving, like Stanley, I've changed it a little bit. I say with great connectivity comes great responsibility. <laughs> and if we don't think through, should we connect this? Do we have to connect this? Is the risk of connecting this greater than the benefits of doing so? Because we want the promise of connected medicine, but we can't afford the peril. And an exotic failure could trigger a crisis of confidence in the public to trust these otherwise superior devices. 
And that would be the real harm, right? Because these things on the whole are improving our lives. And then right when we were about to release the report, WannaCry was our worst uh, fears come true. Now, for many of you, you heard about some damage from WannaCry, but the, the, the line you may not have heard is, in the UK alone, 65 hospitals were taken offline in one day. Some of these were urgent care facilities like stroke centers where if you don't fix it within a three-hour window, you can't fix it. That was 20% of their national trust capacity is what they call it, the national trusts. And luckily, this particular city was not one of the ones affected, but the Ariana Grande bombings just a few days later, uh, had they had been an affected unit, uh, would have dramatically uh, in, impaired their emergency response. So for me and Bo, we went into crisis management mode trying to help DHS, uh, White House, HHS, the UK government. But they all thought that the exposure to hospitals was really patient healthcare information. They're not ready for this. They're not trained for this. And the current level of investment says that they need our help. And one of the things we want to get out of this is how can we each contribute and help? So I'm going to flip to the physician friends and our hacker pals here. You know, to see, for us as hackers, we were concerned about what WannaCry represented, and we got very lucky in the U.S. as the most connected nation. Had it not been for that kill switch, we would have seen uh, some serious harm. What was it like for you guys as physicians? I mean, I, we have a background in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest response, and as clinicians, we take a look at this uh, from a so somewhat different angle than I think the popular media conveyed. The popular media sort of uh, thought that this was more of a bullet dodged situation in which, uh, yeah, grandma's elective hip replacement was postponed or rescheduled, but other than that, um, nobody died from WannaCry. And I think that we have now evidence in the medical literature that these types of disruption uh, to care is actually pretty significant. Um, once we get our uh, slide back up. We'll, we'll show you a paper that was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine that actually took a look at um, the care of uh, people experiencing heart attacks or strokes in major cities that also coincidentally had a marathon that resulted in the closure of main roads. And so this paper took a look both during and after a marathon. If you need to be picked up by an ambulance and taken to a hospital, one of these time critical elements like a stroke or a heart attack, you actually had a significant, statistically significant controlled for delay of care when there was a marathon in town that resulted in road closure. And you had a higher 30-day mortality rate as a result of that. And so those are statistics that we as clinicians use when we're measuring the effects of things like smoking or alcohol on mortality. We can now, the data is there, it has not been crunched yet, but we can probably sift through WannaCry and show that if you were experiencing one of these events during a ransomware outage of a hospital, your outcome was demonstrably worse all other things being equal. So that's very important for us as physicians and epidemiologists. The other thing is that we're trained to have a background to think about ways patients can be harmed in many different non-traditional ways. So when you look on TV and there's the classic, um, something's been hacked, it's a very dramatic hit the button and someone dies, right? A pacemaker or an AICD attack, right? But remember, you guys are very important. You're very valuable human beings. There's many different ways that, short of killing you, we can make your life suck. So if we don't diagnose your stroke, we don't have the medicine, if we don't diagnose your stroke within three hours or so of you having it, if we miss that opportunity because our CT scanner is down because you got hit with WannaCry, and we can't determine whether or not you have blood in your head or you don't, and able to give you a medication, you may never walk again. So if you think about it in that kind of paradigm, the security of hospitals can impact patient care more than just a body count. We're talking about people's lives, their ability to walk, talk, function, walk upstairs. Um, and then so much of that makes it very complicated to calculate. So if you can imagine, there's so many different ways to harm people because of these systems being so overconnected that we might not even be able to actually study the impact. It may be so difficult to isolate. But what we're confident of is that this does indeed happen. And I'm sh pretty confident that someone has died because of this. And it hasn't made the nightly news. A lot, of because, a lot of the reason because of what Josh pointed out, there's not a single security person on staff at most hospitals, right? Who here works in healthcare at all? Does anybody work tangentially with healthcare? That's a pretty good amount. Um, so yeah, so you, you are there in the trenches on, an, on a daily basis. I think the other thing that you run into, obviously, is from the clinician standpoint, the medical staff is not literate in the concepts that you think about on a daily basis. 
And so part of the challenge of what Christian and I have tried to do in our own little niche is we kind of jokingly call ourselves both white coats and white hats. We need to kind of have one foot in both of those worlds and translate the experiences that you have on a daily basis to our clinician friends while also taking a lot of the excellent research that has been done by some of our colleagues in, into individual vulnerabilities in the laboratory setting and use our knowledge as medical practitioners to directly translate that into how that affects the physiology of our patients. And we'll get to that. Uh, but this is essentially the excerpt of that article that we had spoke to where you are essentially more likely to die of your problems when there's a marathon in town. So luckily, we had met several years prior and gotten involved with the cavalry. And because of that, we had some things cooking up in the background. We all sat together at a table, recognizing that this is something tremendously important. We knew the clock was ticking. We knew that an attack was coming and that there was going to be someone on the nightly news that for the first time in history has died because of ransomware or died because of a compromised uh, medical device running legacy OSs. So we had a conference, or not truly a conference, more of a, a summit, if you will. We brought together people we thought were missing from the equation, right? You guys are a tremendously valuable resource in, your in the knowledge that you have about these things and the ability to educate those, not only in the policy realm, but in hospitals. Even patients themselves is tremendously valuable. And we're working in silos. I know it's a cliche, but it's very, very true. So we thought we'd bring people together um, from law enforcement, manufacturers of devices themselves, they get uh, a lot of heat, uh, probably somewhat deserving um, for some of them, that they make insecure medical devices. We brought them to the table. We brought clinicians, which has traditionally been a voice that's been pretty absent. Uh, for those of you that work in healthcare, just want to take a quick straw poll. Who here has had a clinician actively engage in the security uh, process, give insight onto vulnerabilities or anything like that? Anyone? That's awesome. We need more of that because they can often scope risk to patients. They know which devices will kill people and which ones won't. And that might not be very obvious at first. It's not the sexy AICD pacemaker hack on television that may kill the first person. It may be something obscure that you wouldn't know about unless you took care of patients. We need to talk with security researchers. We need to work with policymakers. We want to talk more about that. But the most important thing that we need to be doing is focusing on patients. It's true what Josh said. HIPAA is boring. We have I'm sorry, HIPAA is boring. Does anyone disagree with me? No, like we're, yeah, okay. Equifax, all this stuff gets hacked, all, all this stuff gets leaked all the time. Yes, personal health information is important to protect because of fill in whatever rationale, but for the most part, hospitals do that because there's a HIPAA hammer and they're going to get a giant fine. What happens when the first person dies? That's a whole new era of regulation that we have no idea what's going to happen. And just as Josh mentioned, sometimes the response, the policy response or the public outcry in response to these types of events may be way worse than what we really need. So that's an important thing. So the main challenge that presented us with this event was how to kind of unify everybody into being able to understand in a very visceral way the threats posed by both medical device vulnerabilities as well as hospital infrastructure. And to do that, we kind of cribbed a little bit from what we had growing up in medical school, um, basically clinical simulation, which was itself cribbed from aviation. But essentially, the key concept with medical simulation is you can only really be good at something if you do it a bunch of times. And there are certain events, really high stakes, critical events that are so important that you need to be really good at them, but you may see them once or twice in your entire career. Massive obstetric hemorrhage, multi-vehicular, multiple victim trauma, really, really rare emergencies that you still need to drill down and really understand how to execute when the, t when the clock is ticking and it really matters. We set up what we know to be the first of their kind, clinical simulations. We're going to kind of give you a little bit of an overview about why they're important and why we had them at this event. But they involved essentially what patients would look like in the real world if they were affected by some of these vulnerabilities that we know we can do in the laboratory space. And we did so in a way we tried to avoid the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that we got criticized a lot for. We wanted to keep these as medically accurate as possible. Um, Jeff and I crafted these clinical simulations ourselves. As you'll see in the videos, they are very uh, sound medically. They're based in uh, the practice of medicine and emergency care. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about who's involved, but what you'll see on the screen are med students, doctors, um, and a whole bunch of other people that are 
trained to take care of emergencies, but they might not be trained to take care of this. Now, we were very lucky. We um, were fortunate to have this covered on Nightline in, in a segment. And it's very difficult to straddle that line, right? We all want to raise awareness to these uh, kind of critical systems and their insecurities because we fear people are going to die. But making sure that we can avoid the sensationalist media lens on a lot of this is a, is a hard thing to straddle because otherwise a lot of this message falls on deaf ears. So we worked very hard to make these as sound as possible medically and to convince people on the other end that this is actually what could happen. This, what we're about to show you footage of, is as close to reality as we can get to what would happen if a medical device was compromised. So we hope you enjoy them. All right, let's see if the audio works through the handheld. I'll do my best. All right, so we're in a simulation room. This is a room that's made to look like a hospital setting. There's a wall with some one-way glass. And there's operators on the other side that are controlling the patient's blood pressure, controlling all the things that go on the monitor. They can see through, but the people on the other side can't. These are all volunteers. They know what's going on. Okay, they're clinically trained. That's Jeff right there, and there's the three med students that are involved. They're going to simulate what it would look like in an emergency department bay, essentially, what a nurse present, a tech, the other people that would be involved in the care of emergencies. This physician was recruited, does not know what the simulation is at all. Did not know it was anything about hacking medical devices, was completely ignorant. All the only, thing, only thing she knew was that she was going to go to a simulation, was getting it filled by Nightline, and she should uh, really study up on her medicine, essentially. Be, like anything that could happen. So she's here meeting her team. They're waiting something to happen. They're awaiting a call to come in from the EMS service, okay? So the EMS, or emergency medical services, the paramedics, ambulance, are gonna bring a patient in. And we're gonna see what happens. Short of this, uh, the photographer, you see someone filming, they're not obviously not part of the team, and there's a kind of full suite of capabilities there. What you don't see in the screen is that Close to the head of the bed here is a full set of vital sign machines, infusion pumps, and a big um, container, if you will, of medical supplies. So that if this doctor should need something during the care of this patient, they can pull something out and actually simulate that they're giving it. They need to give a life-saving medication. They need to do chest compressions. They need to do emergent surgery. Those types of medical equipment are present there. Again, to mention, as Jeff did, that this is something we, we do often in, in clinical training. We run through these types of things, but we've never done this before for hacked medical devices. So right now, essentially, it's very common practice to, as the person who's in charge, she's delegating roles, discussing what each team member is going to be responsible for doing. At this point, they've already heard over the patch that there's a gentleman coming in with a complaint of chest pain. So they're getting ready for what they may need to take care of that chief complaint. In order to maintain the fidelity as high as it possibly can, we have uh, actors or standardized patients who are trained to present with certain symptoms and answer, be able to answer questions in response to what the doctor is trying to run through their differential diagnosis. So you'll see initially we have a live person roll in and they're very good. They portray their illness. They have all of the correct answers. They know all their medications that they're taking at home, et cetera. And these are, these are something where even having written them and having participated in them and seen them a million times, you very quickly forget that you're watching a simulation, especially if you're in there in, in the room and your heartbeat raises a little bit and it's still kind of PTSD watching these for me right now. Some of these actors were scary good. So basically, he's reporting what symptoms he had. He was watching TV. He all of a sudden started to feel some chest pain. And as a doctor, obviously, in an elderly male who comes in with chest pain, you're, you're worried about a number of very serious conditions. This patient had typical history. Imagine another 65-year-old male, kind of similar stuff, high blood pressure, maybe had a mild heart attack five years ago, but otherwise is a pretty healthy guy. Has some chest pain, feels a little lightheaded. So as a physician, you're trained right off the bat to ask the questions that are going to help you 
rule out what's going to kill the patient in the next five minutes. Then you go what's going to kill them in the next half an hour. Then what's going to put them in the hospital. Then what can they follow up their doctor on? So if you still hear what she was saying, she'd be running through questions like that. So one of the vital pieces of information or clues in this case is an EKG that shows that this patient's heart rate is very fast, 170, 180 beats per minute. It's also not regular. It's a common disease called atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. And the details aren't important, but essentially this happens every single day. I see this case every other day in the emergency department. Very common for a patient to come in in this, and traditionally a very treatable disease. There are great medications that can lower this patient's heart rate, stop their chest pain, and then based on what happens in this, this patient will probably be able to go home the same day. So this doctor is running through other tests they want to run, blood they want to draw, x-rays that they want to do. And these scenarios are going to tie back to very specific reported vulnerabilities. So this isn't just we're saying these vague medical devices can probably be hacked. These tie back into research that our friends have done. Okay. So you might be able to, at this point, see what's coming. So this doctor is elected to give a common medication to treat this. It's called deltiazem, or it's a calcium channel blocker, essentially. Now the patient's losing consciousness. The medication was started with a bolus, meaning they gave someone an IV and then they started a drip. That drip ran through an infusion pump. Now the patient doesn't have a pulse. Patients are, the people in the room are starting to freak out and say this patient's essentially dead. Their heart has stopped meaningfully pumping blood to their brain and their heart. And then and the, the actors, lights turn out. The actors are good up until a point, but they don't like it if you're pushing on their chest 100 times a minute. So at the point when they do lose consciousness and we switch over to what we call a code situation, we bring in a high fidelity mannequin. And this mannequin can pretty much do anything short of independent bot. You can control all of its vital signs. You can have different physical exam findings. You can do CPR on it as we're doing right now. So this doctor right now had a patient come in with a very simple, common condition and did the basic simple therapy and all of a sudden he's unresponsive and in cardiac arrest. Their mind is not even close to where it needs to be right now. And in some of these situations, in order to kind of help them out a little bit, we do kind of give them little clues and point them in the right direction. So there's no, at this point, there's no explanation for why this patient suddenly went from talking to you to dead. So I make my way over to the infusion pump, and I notice that this entire syringe that contained not just a bolus, but enough of the continuous medication to last them several hours is now suddenly empty. The medicine that was supposed to go over hours went in in three minutes. This patient's uh, heart is essentially stopped, and because of the medication they gave, um, it's essentially an overdose. And once this patient has suffered an overdose of this medication, in the real world, most likely this patient would die. An overdose of this medication at the rate that we're talking about makes it essentially the treatments that we would normally treat at a hospital cardi or sorry, cardiac arrest like this just generally won't work. So in reality, this patient would probably die, but we're going to give it the college try. In response to this overdose, there are very specific medications you have to give, anecdotes, if you will, antidotes, if you will, to counteract this calcium channel overdose. And there are things like adrenaline we see on television. They're continuing chest compressions. It's giving calcium. It's giving vasopressors to stop the blood pressure, because at this time, the blood pressure is non-existent. And this? Attending physician in particular is a, is a board certified fellowship trained toxicologist. So she knows exactly what to do in, in this situation and she's incredibly intelligent and she's like really, really good. And yet you can still see at this point, just being in the room, that the light hasn't quite gone in yet. She knows that all this medicine has been given, but she hasn't really put two and two together as to what happened and why that might be an issue. And so we'll talk about, once we get the patient stabilized, kind of her thought process and how that really showed that this is not something that's even on our radar. She's also placed a breathing tube to breathe for this patient. And at this point, the medications that she has given have worked. Luckily, the calcium and, and the interlipid and the vasopressors and all those crazy things worked. Got the patient's heart rate back and sent them to the ICU, where that patient 
um, as we mentioned previously, in reality would not have survived probably. So we have a quick question, and then I want Josh to kind of comment on the most impactful <laughs> portion of the debrief session for him. But first, let's get your quick question. Okay, so I just, since I'm not in the medical field, mm -hmm. I'm just curious if he is the uh, Perfect, perfect segue, perfect segue for Josh. So um, this is just one of the three cases we did, and in all three cases, um, the, the physicians had no idea they were hacked at all. And given that people die in an ER, they would have just moved on and said, oh, we lost one. Uh, when we pressed her and we tried to ask her what she thought led to this, she, she thought it was a human error that just didn't set up the entry correct. In fact, um, it's hard to tell because you couldn't hear, but the antidote was delivered through the say, said same compromised device. And, but it gets better, it gets better. Um, and I'll say this quickly, and maybe it'll come up during Q&A again. Wave two, she said, oh my God, if I knew it had been compromised, I would have grabbed the same unit from the room next door. And once again, the cavalry folks were like, not gonna help, we hacked the drug library. Every single one in that hospital was gonna have the same problem. And she is not a bad doctor, and that's not, not malpractice by any means. We implicitly trust these devices. As physicians, you, you, you have to or else you can't do your job. If you are paranoid and looking over everything, we'd still be in the Stone Age. So she is the avatar for every other physician not here in this room in the rest of the country. And one more thing is that a lot of these uh, technical adjuncts, right, a computerized infusion pump was designed to prevent human error. So in the old days, the amount of medication that went in was based on a nurse titrating a roller ball, right? And that probably killed, you know, hundreds of thousands of people over the decades that that happened, right? No, I'm not saying that nurses are bad. That's just the way it is. Doctors would be way worse at it than nurses. They would kill way more people if they were in charge of the IV drip. But these infusion pumps were designed to take the human error out of it and rely on technical infrastructure, rely on software, rely on these things that then come out saying this is way safer, use this. Well, we've used it and we trust it. Now they're hacking them and we're terrified. So we're gonna get the next one rolling and kinda as that gets started up, we can take a few more quick questions. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, especially in the absence of forensics, which is something we can also talk about. Oh, so that's, <laughs> we could spend hours on this, but just to plant the seed, not answer your own question, the question, once she realized that all of them could be harmed, she asked, should we have every hospital buy two different makes and models so that if one goes down, we have a backup, but does that double the training cost and complexity? Another question was, would we even have asked for a forensics? grab from the device, and moreover, up until very recently, there were no requirements at all for any tamper-evident, forensically sound evidence capture. So these questions we stimulated through this very visceral exercise got us past the idea that we're trained for this, this wouldn't be a big issue, to we are totally not trained for this. So let's do the more, the more exotic one next. So same situation, different doctor has no idea what's going on. Um, Similarly, we'll be told about a patient coming in complaining of shocking sensation in his chest. So every minute or so, this patient just gets a shock in their chest, and they have a history of a pacemaker AICD. It's very uncomfortable to be in a situation like this as a physician because you want to think that you're trained to handle everything, but the reality, of course, is that we're not. And especially when you have no idea what's going on, it can be absolutely terrifying. So all these people, we give them mad props for even signing up for this because it really wasn't fair to them. It's basically having them treat a disease they've never seen before or even thought about. It's kind of hard. I really wish you could hear this guy. This is my favorite actor of the day. Not yet. We wanted to debut them here. <laughs> well, 
So again, this physicians going and asking the questions they would. What's been going on? How long have you had chest pain? Oh, it's shocking you. What's your medical problems? What medicines are you on? And periodically, you'll see him jump and scream because his AICD is shocking him. So essentially, he had a condition that rendered the normal natural conduction system of his heart inoperable. And as a result, he needed a cardiologist to go in and place a device that would be able to read and sense the rhythms and when appropriate, give him a shock. Which is definitely not pleasant, especially if you're awake. You hear that at all? Am I going to die? Am I going to die? Yeah, he asked, am I going to die? Was it every minute on the minute? We have no idea why. And in most cases, it, it's probably something that is very unpleasant and annoying, but ultimately wouldn't really interfere with the functioning of the heart unless you were to hit the heart in a one to 200 millisecond window in which the ventricles, the bottom chambers, are repolarizing, at which point you can send a patient in something called an RNT phenomenon, essentially stop their heartbeat altogether, which eventually is going to unfortunately happen to our poor, poor patient. So to translate that, every time that this shocks this guy, sorry, he's brilliant, he's way smarter than me, way smarter than me, and everything he said is spot on. To, to translate that, every time it shocks him, it's like rolling a D20. D20, anyone? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and unfortunately, if it rolls a one, it shocks at the right, the perfect time, perfectly inopportune time, if you will, right when the heart's repolarizing. And when it does that, if that, you hit it at that magic window, the heart stops. So every time it's shocking, it's rolling that 20-sided die. Hope you don't roll a one. And this is something that we can accidentally do as physicians who are trying to shock somebody out of a different heart rhythm. It's kind of considered poor form. Um, so we try to avoid doing it. And there are, special, there are special pads that will prevent you from shocking at that moment. But it happens. So this is all, this, none of this is science fiction. This is real medicine. I've seen this 30 times. It still gets me every time he screams. Uh oh, roll the one. And we have all the same monitors that we do in the ED. So right now it would show essentially a wavy fibrillation pattern. Um, and that's when you as a doctor are like, holy crap. Lights out again, mannequin, because you don't want to push on a patient, that person's chest, it hurts. So this is death number one. We have a counter. Death one. So doing all the things they would encode, getting ready to shock, giving medications like adrenaline, worrying about the airway, whether or not they're going to breathe for this patient. And we're actually getting ready to put pads on to shock him back on our end, but what we are about to realize is that he still has a device inside his body that is probably going to help him out even if it may be compromised. So the guy who was doing chest compressions just got shocked himself, and we didn't put pads on. So that told us, told this doctor, holy crap, his AICD is still working. It just shocked him back to life. Remember, it's shocking every minute, regardless of whether or not his heart's beating or not. Yeah. Not literally, but he's an actor. Oh, you mean the patient? He he was an actor too, so he so this is basically what we're saying is that's the clue to the doctor to think, man, this thing is still firing, even when patients coded, his AICD is still firing. Death number two. So the shock brought him back and then it happened again. It shocked in that right inopportune moment and killed him again. I mean, if we ever saw this in real life, I'd just, like, give up. Yeah, I'd be like, this is not meant to be. I'm out. So this patient has a medical device that is compromised, continuing to malfunction, and has literally killed this patient twice now. So as a doctor, what are you going to do about that? Right now, he's placing a breathing tube 
because he realizes this resuscitation is going to take a while, and it's probably a good idea this patient has some oxygen going to their brain. Of course, he nails it. One of my chief residents. I love him so much. I owed him a case of beer after this. Now, we have cut chunks out of this just for brevity. I mean, Josh, you were in the room watching it from behind the glass. Like, what was that experience like? I mean, I knew it was, I knew it was a simulation, but that doctor didn't act any differently. You could see his adrenaline. You could see he was stressed out. He was trying his training. His training wasn't working. So they're getting ready to shock this patient. Didn't work. Oh, I guess it did. There's so many cuts. So he's reflecting to say, what we're doing isn't working. We keep bringing him back, keep shocking him at the inopportune time, he keeps dying. What do you do? Someone said disable the device. Good externally pace. They do know he has an AACD. We'll go through the questions at the end, but basically this doctor is just saying, what do we do? Now, I don't know if we cut this, you can tell me, but um, they are trained that sometimes these malfunction due to glitches, and they could put a magnet on the device, which puts it into a safe mode. Did you guys include that? We did. So he's, car he's calling cardiology, and if you are the cardiologist being pulled off the golf course to answer this, you're going to be like, well, have you put the magnet on? But what some people may not know is that there are new models of pacemakers that have the ability to specifically disable that functionality to be reset by the magnet. So there's firmware control of pacemaker override. So code's running on the phone with the cardiologist, as Jeff mentioned. The cardiologist said, use the thing that you're supposed to do. And he says, I did, but it didn't work. Right now, we are on the test right now, trying to make sure you get around this. Uh, no comment. <laughs> uh, to be clear, this is a pacemaker slash defibrillator. So it has the electroshock capability. An automated, implantable cardioverter defibrillator, if we're being technical. <laughs> So ultimately what you have is you have a device that is connected to the layers of muscle in the heart by wires. And if everything else isn't working, you're ultimately going to have to sever that connection. So this guy is basically being told something that no doctor has probably done in practice since like the mid 70s or 80s, which is essentially called a runaway pacemaker. You have to actually go in and cut those pacer leads. Yeah. Maggie doesn't work. Yeah, so basically in the olden days, before we had fancy things like magnets and we were able to kind of reprogram them on the fly, you would have to actually, if you had a malfunctioning pacemaker, go in and snip the electrical connection between the device and the epicardium itself. Yeah. While it's firing, yeah, wear gloves. <laughs> um, this is going to be a quick uh, little, I just wanted to pause it for a minute and just talk about what exactly what Jeff mentioned, but then also that this is something uh, no ER doc has done for a couple decades, like Jeff mentioned, but also that's something that's very hard to decide to do. Okay, like it takes, I don't know if guts is right. Think about doing something you read in a textbook five years ago that no one's done in 20 years that a cardiologist over the phone is telling you to do for the first time. And if you do it, maybe the patient will live. Well, the patient's gonna die anyways, they're dead. You're worried about getting sued. What if you made the wrong call? There's so many things. It's not like television where someone drops dead in an elevator of a hospital and then they decide next step to drill someone's head because, of course, they have a brain bleed. These decisions are <laughs> difficult. They are hard. And in the absence of evidence, it's really hard to make a life-saving decision. And even if you do make the right decision, there's no guarantee that it's going to save this patient's life. Behind the glass, everyone said, is he going to get shocked while he's actually cutting into the chest? Because, you know, the observers didn't know if this was even a safe procedure. 
And I mean, when I say these things are realistic, we actually built a mannequin in which you could cut into its skin, find the pacer wires, and snip the pacer wires. So that's that's not like makeup. Like that's our actual model. I mean, it is makeup, but it's not like fake makeup. It's real makeup. And if it wasn't enough, let's pause it for one more second because this is something I want to explain. This patient has a pacemaker for a reason. You're going to hear us say time and time again, we are scared that patients are going to be scared to use life-saving medical devices because they're going to be hacked. We do not want people to turn away from using life-saving medical devices because they see something on Nightline that their pacemaker is going to be hacked. This patient had a pacemaker for a reason. Their heart needed it to function. Well, what did we just do? We, we cut it out. So the underlying disease this patient has isn't going to go away magically because they're in the emergency department. It's going to come back. And because of that, we have to externally pace. We have to replace the function of the malfunctioning pacemaker. So that's everyone here realizing that this patient is still not doing well despite cutting out that pacemaker. That's death number four. <laughs> death number four. I recognize him. It's really mad to get taken off the golf course. You to put my suit on. You couldn't hear it, but their cool names were like. I think this one was Dr. Caligula, but. <laughs> So these are really, really visceral, and I think that they were really well received, and it kind of highlights the focus that we have as physicians directly, one patient at a time. But it's not really the entire story, and it wasn't the entirety of this event, too, because it's also important to take a look at things from the system's perspective as well. So we got a little bit of a late start. We're going to compress some of the rest. Uh, there were actually three simulations. The third one um, was a vehicular accident, and we treated the patient's wounds, not paying attention to the fact that the patient had an insulin pump, and the car crash was caused by the, the driver passing out from a, an excessive dose of, uh, of insulin. Um, so failing to look at root cause is just something that would not be expected if you implicitly trust these devices. Now that was day one of this two-day summit. Day two in some ways was more profound. Um, it was less visually captivating, which was very focused on the individual experiences of, of a clinician. Day two, we had hospital administrators, the mayor's office, the governor's office, members of DHS, FDA, FEMA, um, law enforcement where we had hospital staff as well, and we did tabletop crisis simulations of what if you did a ransomware on a single hospital, this hospital we're in, a level one trauma. In fact, we called it an extortionware because there was no malware. We just logged in with factory default passwords to the HVAC system, the EHR, and one other thing. And we, wanted, we called it an extortionware. Um, we logged them out. They couldn't get back in without giving us $300,000. Um, one facility on the 4th of July weekend, and it affected the uh, elevators, uh, EHRs, imaging systems, uh, anything that had uh, hard-coded passwords. And sadly, you can Google hard-coded passwords for most of these devices. Um, some of them are quite comical, in fact. We knew that this would be handled fairly well because you can divert ambulances, cancel procedures, move things to others in the geographic region. By round two, what we wanted to do was do the similar thing to plural hospitals in the vicinity to see where do things break and when and how. Um, and we figured by round three, we'd add a physical attack like the Boston Marathon bombing uh, to see with diminished capacity, what would they do? What are they trained to do? Um, we started having casualties in round one. We didn't expect it at all. And guess what? When you can't operate elevators, uh, the surgical wings are not on the same floor as the ER. So surgeries were impeded. Didn't even know it was going to happen, right? One of the reasons you drill is to reveal these things. 
Uh, number two, EMRs. Even if we stood up a field hospital and a gymnasium with the National Guard, if they don't know your blood type, if they don't know your medical history, your allergies, not much they could do. We figured, Bo and I figured, they'd just go to paper records. But the hospital said, you know what, we, we stopped training our physicians. We don't even teach them how to enter them anymore. You know, we've heard for three years in the government that we'll just fail, fail over to paper records. You might be able to backwards looking look at paper records, but could you still issue orders? Um, and are they being trained or are they being sufficiently trained? Um, by round two, we did several in the same city and things started to fall apart really fast. And I was expecting um, some prioritization or triage, but um, one of the people that helped us execute this, she, she immediately called, what was it called? The trauma triage or disaster triage. disaster triage, where normally you save the one that's most hurt and you prioritize them first. But in, a, in this, once you call this scenario, you get a little tag with a color code, you only save the savable. Um, you let people die. And we were at that stage in round two. Uh, so we didn't even want to bludgeon the team, but we didn't actually introduce the Arizona Diamondbacks baseball game uh, explosions because they were already having uh, a mass casualty event simply because the heat in Arizona, no refrigeration, no elevators for surgical floors, no access to medical records, not a single zero day, not even a single common vulnerability and exposure. It was hard-coded passwords. So we asked the room, are there any technical barriers to us doing this attack today? No. And it was interesting to see that there was battery backups and capacities and mobile units for certain things, but they were a scant small percentage of the total devices required. Do you guys want to add anything to that? Okay. Have you said it all? Um, what this wants to show, and especially because we wanted the governor to declare a state of emergency or the mayor to have plans, isn't to make them overwhelmed. It isn't to disempower them. It's to say, what broke first? And if we drill for these things, can we flock our finite resources to the things that are the most critical to keep afloat? So instead of having three times as many insulin pumps, excuse me, uh, bedside infusion pumps, maybe the most important thing to guard is the electronic health record or, or whatnot. So uh, we want to do this as a 50 state initiative. We want to go to each governor of each state and say which hospital networks and which people do you want to include and how do we fix this. And we deliberately didn't use some sort of science fiction plot. These are actual passwords. Um, we did include most of these government agencies. Um, most of them also over the last year and a half have been working with us and many of your, your friends to try to create first of a kind policies to get in front of this. One of the things that was the most transformative and simple was uh, we wrote a Hippocratic Oath for connected medical devices. It was much like our automotive five star. We basically said all systems fail. So as a manufacturer, can you uh, avoid failure, take help avoiding failure without suing the helper? Uh, capture, study, and learn from failure. Have a way to uh, inoculate against future failure and contain and isolate failure. And as such, what we said to the hospitals, they said, we can't buy all new equipment. We don't have infinite money. And we said, OK, so don't spend more money. Spend your money better. So as you go to get the next generation of infusion pumps, do they have the ability to be patched? Do they have tamper-evident logging to facilitate an autopsy, an autopsy if something went wrong? Um, so we're not necessarily looking to break their banks or break their cultures. We're looking to support their intent, not, not supplant it. And then one of the things we realized for the hackers in the room is we also want us to be much more conscientious about the nature of healthcare. These safety critical spaces, it's not like you drop a, a, drop a bug or do a disclosure and they'll just be able to fix it tomorrow like a web page or web service. Um, there's very different adversaries here, including accidents and adversaries. There's very different consequences of failure, potentially involving public safety, human life, or hits to GDP. Um, the operational context, they're not segmented and isolated. They're very flat and open. Uh, the composition of goods is quite different. Uh, but really, the economics is pretty debilitating for medical equipment, especially because they have no money for healthcare security staff, as we talked about earlier. And moreover, it can take a very, very, very long time to fix these things. If it's patchable, the recent defib um, pacemaker flaw took about a calendar year from the revelation to the, the, the firmware patch. Uh, if it's not patchable, it takes six years to go from having a decision to make a new medical device, doing the R&D clinical trials and getting it through the FDA. If it's an implantable, it's more like 10 to 15 years. So if you think those response times are great, then just go ahead and drop O'Day. Uh, but one of the things we want people to do is be very conscientious about, given the physics are different for safety critical and the time scales are different, um, 
we really want a multi-stakeholder decision with FDA, with patients care centric in the decision, et cetera, and that's what we try to promulgate. So we want to tie up a little bit here. Hopefully this is the start of a conversation, not the end. And if you think about these material weaknesses that we flagged to the task force report, these are wicked problems for which we don't have easy fixes. I'd love to talk over some bourbon on about how far down the rabbit hole we went on something like legacy. There's like nine levels of hell below that legacy bullet. Um, it's, it's really bad. Um, but what I want to challenge this room, because you're passionate, you're smart, you're talented, if you're a CISO and you're looking for your next role, maybe consider being a CISO in a hospital. If you're a, a, a hacker and you want to hack on something interesting or new, maybe be one of the, you know, start participating in one of these coordinated disclosure programs. And if you have some clever ideas about how you could maybe be a Sherpa guide, maybe you aren't going to change your job, but you can introduce yourself to the CIO or the biomed services people of your local hospital and offer to get lunch with them once in a while and ask them what they need help with if they want a primer on something. Bring them to a local OWASP meeting. So I don't know what the answers are, but everybody in here can do something for this. And I think because we're starting to have this recognition, because we are over-dependent on these undependable things, uh, because we got lucky with WannaCry, not Petchia, We've had fires, we will have more, and we're going to have some responses. I hope they're thoughtful, planful, literate responses, and I hope that you guys can help us be ready for that. So these things aren't fun, they aren't comfortable. We've been accused of FUD, even though it had actual physicians and real physics and science applied. Um, but they're not gonna go away and no one's gonna come fix these. So we believe we're gonna uh, get in front of these with these visceral, experiential, fact-based, science-based simulations. We need more help. I mean, more advocacy, and we need the right attitude. So I thank you for your time tonight.